every week I have a choice to make, and that is to choose whether to give you a technical report or a devotional report of the book. And the technical report on this book would be astounding. I mean, there are so many technicalities in this book. We could talk about the co-regnum theory, about the dual reigns of the kings, and Tila and his work on, on corresponding all those. And he found out that all of the numbers of the mysterious numbers of the Hebrew kings exactly march right down the line with everything that has been found archaeologically. And I mean, you know, you could go home with that and probably use it to start your fire with. And so I made the choice to look at Second Kings devotionally. Now, for those of you that are, you love the deep Hebrew word studies, we're not going to do them. We're going to go through the whole book, and I've got for you eight pictures that are in this book. And they're beautiful pictures. The story of the axe head that swam. The story of the pot of oil that didn't run out. The story of uh, the little boy that, that God gave to the Shunammite woman and he died and Elisha just lays on top of him nose to nose, eye to eye, cheek to cheek, mouth to mouth, and just laid on top of him and he came back to life. Those are all beautiful stories. I've always heard them as beautiful stories, but I read just about everything I could looking for why did God tell us those pretty stories? I mean, what are they besides cheek to cheek, eye to eye? I mean, what is the story about? I mean, why did he, out of all the billions of things that were happening during these 250 years that this book covers, why did he pick those stories? And we're going to have a good time. We can start right in 1 Kings, in the first chapter, and let me read until we get up there. I thought this was fascinating, and let's read this first paragraph. During the period covering the last 130 years of Israel, that means uh, this is from 852 to 722. That's their last 130 years before they were wiped out and carried away by the Assyrians. And the last 250 years of Judah. And, and similarly, it's those uh, last days before they were taken away. Second Kings records the response of the people to these prophets in the order they spoke and wrote. And here are the prophets in chronological order that are represented in this book. Now, isn't this, this is a galaxy. Can you imagine getting sermons and books from these people? I mean, a good Chuck Swindoll book. I mean, I, I read almost everything he writes and a lot of other authors. But you know what? I read them and I put them away and that's it. But did you know? that what these guys wrote is going to last forever because it's the word of God. Listen to the galaxy of speakers they had. Elijah during those years. Elisha following him. Obadiah, who talked about the doom of Edom. Joel, who explained why everything got eaten up by the grasshoppers and how that's just a prefiguring of the judgment to come. Jonah prophesied when the northern kingdom, when they were at the zenith. And when Jonah was a prophet, the northern kingdom had extended their property to the furthest limits. Uh, they had conquered, and they'd almost gotten everything that Solomon and David had had in the old days. And they were all the way to the river, that is the Euphrates, and they were just really having a big time. But the only people that were standing in their way of having total prosperity were the Assyrians that lived in Nineveh. And where did God ask him to go? to the bad guys, to the Assyrians in Nineveh. Fascinating. And Jonah prophesied. And following him, Amos, who was uh, from Tekoa, and Hosea, whose wife ran away from him, became a prostitute, and he bought her at the public auction. And he bought her, he took all of his money, and it's the most touching story, and I can't wait till we get there, and he bid all of his money, and someone equaled his bid, and so he bid all of his money and, and some of his food, and someone equaled that, and so he put on everything he had, and he bought his wife. It's such a, bought her back. Such a touching story when we get to that. And after that, Isaiah, who prophesied for 48 years, Micah for 35 years, Nahum for 30 years, Zephaniah, who gives us such a, an insight, especially that little cute poem at the end, uh, you know, though everything falls apart, you still have the Lord. Jeremiah, 50 years of prophesying and weeping. He was the, the weeping prophet over the wayward southern kingdom. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, actually, but I remember when Swindoll used to pastor in Dallas or Houston or wherever he was down there, he used to go to the truck stops and ask people what they thought of Habakkuk. And they all said, well, my kids have that game. And someone else said, the doctor diagnosed me with Habakkuk. You know, Habakkuk. And Daniel, Daniel, who was taken away in the captivity to Babylon and for 70 years prophesied. And then the final prophet that's covered in these books is uh, Ezekiel. Now, there are post-exilic prophets, and we're going to cover them later. Continuing, the sad truth remains, few listen to God speaking through this group. Few. Few. Emphasis on the few. God's servants listen to his words. 
Did you know, if you're God's servant, you listen to God. And if you listen to God, you're his servant. Second Kings stands as a book about servants. God has good servants and bad servants. He rewards the good. He punishes the bad. Life is all about who we will serve. In this book, we see portraits of failed opportunities to serve God, as well as beautiful lives of service for him. And they're side by side. And they get the same revelation. They get the same story. They get the same message from God. They get the same signs and wonders and some it's like the sun shining on clay and wax one gets softer the other gets harder and that's just the mystery of people's hearts question is who are you serving today you can't serve two masters either you're serving yourself and when you serve yourself you serve the flesh and when you serve the flesh you're serving satan or you're serving god and that's all there's no middle ground some people say well i don't want to be radical i'm just in the middle god says no middle ground either you're self-serving or you're god pleasing we can draw an incredible wealth of lessons on servanthood from this small book here are no less than seven powerful components of those who serve god a a servant of god is number one empowered for ministry. Now I want to emphasize that. I want to underline it in your mind. If you're God's servant, you don't go out half cocked. You don't go out ill prepared. You don't go out powerless or scantily prepared for what you're going to do. You are empowered if you're God's servant. And that's what this whole first section is. If you're God's servant, he empowers you for ministry. And if you want to be God's servant, he wants you to minister. And he's going to give you all the power it takes to do that ministry. Now let's look at a um, kind of a little study on this from this first part of the chapter, okay? First of all, letter A, there must be absolute surrender. And uh, Elisha is our picture we're going to use first, okay? Elisha showed this at his calling. Now, we can go back to 1 Kings 19 if you want to. That's just back a couple of chapters. I want to show you the absolute surrender because this fella is really, his biography begins back in the last book. 19, 19 to 21. So he departed from there, that's Elijah, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. Now, you know what that would be like? That would be like having a Mercedes-Benz garden tractor. I mean, you know, it would be very showy that you were wealthy, prosperous. I mean, nobody plowed with 12 yoke of oxen. I mean, this guy had it made. I mean, he kind of lived, well, in California, it was up the hill. I'm not sure where you'd live here that would be like that. I don't know Tulsa well enough, but in, when we lived in L.A., the higher the hills, the higher you were in the hill with your house, the more valuable and more prestigious you were. And so, you know, people always would say, well, I live in Skyline Drive, you know, and oh, man, everybody knew they were big stuff, you know, at least with the realtors. Well, he had 12 yokes of oxen. Then Elijah passed by him, and look at the end of verse 19. He threw his mantle on him. That was his way of calling him. God had revealed that Elisha was to be the successor of Elijah. And he left the oxen. Notice that these, these earthly things had no attachment. Do you see that? Left them. He didn't set the burglar alarm on them and, and had, you know, he just left them. And ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother. Then I'll follow you. He says, at least, you know, I may never see him again. Let me kiss him goodbye. And uh, he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen equipment and gave it to all the people. And they ate and he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. So he did, he led, left 11 pairs behind for the farm, killed one as an offering to the Lord and, and gave it to the people. And he had, back to your outlines, absolute surrender. And you know what? This showed up all the way through his life. It never stopped. His surrender kept going. And I want to show you, starting in chapter 2 of 2 Kings, uh, in verses 1 through 8. The first thing we see there is that he learned to be a follower. And what I mean by that is that, that it came to pass when it was time for Elijah to go, you, you couldn't shake him. I mean, have you ever had a stray cat or a stray dog? I mean, it just followed you around. I don't know if you ever had that happen, or a stray child. I mean, uh, <laughs> I've had children come up and hold on to me in stores. And then after, you know, and we have so many children that, that you know, I'm used to it. And I look down, and pretty soon that little shaver will look up and they'll go, you know, I mean, they just were, they thought I was the one. And then I remember once Bonnie and I had to find their parents for him because the poor little thing was lost. 
Well, Elisha acted like a lost puppy. He just stayed on Elijah's tail. And look at verse 2. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I am not going to leave you. And that's just, he learned to be a follower. And he just stuck on. He had an absolute surrender to the ministry, to his calling, and he was going to learn to be a follower, and you weren't going to get rid of him. Look at chapter 3, verse 11. The second component of a real servant that's empowered is chapter 3, verse 11. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire? And one of the servants of Israel, uh, of the king of Israel, answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know what that means? He learned to do humble, menial servant work. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. I, he had to go and do what Christ did. He'd get the towel, and he'd get the pitcher, and he didn't do his feet, he did his hands. And, and the mighty prophet Elijah would stand there with his hands out, and Elisha would pour the water on him, and, and he'd take and, and wash his hands. And you know what he learned? He learned by humble service. You know, that's the, the pathway to greatness is humble service. That's what Christ said. I don't know if it's in many of the management books nowadays, but you know what the Lord said? He said the way up is down. The way to the front is to the end. He said when someone invites you to the feast, remember what he said? Go sit at the back table. And then when they're walking around, they'll go, oh, you should be up here at the head table. And then you'll have honor instead of parking, you know, and trying to, you ever notice people, they try and take the best seats, you know, and the best, if you sit in those best seats and the, the head of the feast comes by, the Lord said, they'll say, uh, could you please move? I need this chair. Isn't that embarrassing? Wouldn't you rather sit at the back and be brought up? The Lord said, learn secondly, by humble service. Thirdly, he learned impartiality. And that's in chapter four, one through 37. And basically what, what he learned there is he was a man that learned to serve God completely, whether or not. You notice this widow had nothing to offer him, and that's in verses 1 through 7. And the Shunammites were so wealthy that they added on to their house and made him his own condo. And you know what? He served them both the same. God is no respect of persons. And that word respect of persons is he doesn't make a judgment based on someone's face whether it's clean or dirty or black or white, or whether it's wealthy or whatever. He doesn't make a value judgment on our face. That is one of the signs of servanthood. He learned impartiality. He was not prejudiced. He was not partial to people. He did not have respective faces. Fourthly, he learned to do things God's way. Boy, now, now we're getting the tough stuff. I mean, most of us can follow a bit. We can do humble stuff. We can try to be impartial. But you know where it really gets hard? Doing stuff God's way instead of our way. You ever struggle with that? The Lord says, dun, 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 dun. And we go, dun, dun, mm, dun, dun. And he goes, huh, dun, 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 dun. And we go, huh, I don't. Well, chapter 5 is all about that. And we're going to go in depth in this. But Naaman, Naaman the leper, God wanted to do something great for him. He wanted to take this exalted man and totally devastate him and humble him. And then he wanted to do a miracle on him. Well, did you know that, that Elisha had to cooperate? I mean, one of the examples, verse 9 of chapter 5, Naaman went with his horses, his chariots, and he didn't have horses and chariots alone. He brought $1.495 million with him 3,000 years ago. Do you know how much $1.5 million would have bought 3,000 years ago? I mean, you could have bought all of North America, I bet. I mean, everything, and a lot more. I mean, can you imagine? And that, outside of Elisha's door was this guy in verse 5 that had 10 talents of silver, $160,000, because a talent's 16 grand. So, so he had $160,000 in silver, which is an awful lot as far as uh, just carrying that around. And then he had 6,000 shekels of gold. That's $1.28 million. That's two talents. That's 200 pounds of gold. And 10 changes of clothes. And here he is in verse 9 with his horses, his chariot, and this... Can you imagine him in full battle dress outside the door? And you know what God said to Elisha? Don't go out. Don't even answer the door. Can you imagine that? Having this mighty warrior and all that loot outside. He had to learn to do things God's way. We'll come back to that because it's a beautiful story. And God humbles uh, Naaman in nine specific ways. I want to point them out to you later. Number five, he learned to trust God completely. Look at chapter six, verse 15. Here they are surrounded. And this is another cute story. Verse nine tells us of chapter six. And this is a great one. It shows the power of God. The king of Syria would be huddled in his inner chamber with his generals. And they'd say, 
okay? Move the troops over by the pass, by the Yarmouk River. So they'd all go, okay. And they'd go get the troops, and they'd get over there, and the Israelites would be standing up there going, you know, they'd already be set up, you know, and they were defending the place. And they'd go, how'd they know we were going there? So they'd go back to his palace, and they'd say, this time, bring them around the backside of the Sea of Galilee. So they'd all come around the backside, and there's the Israeli army. You know, we're here. And look what he says. Verse 11. The heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servant and says, won't you show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, none of us, my lord, the king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king your words that you speak in your bedroom. Now, wouldn't you be afraid if the neighboring army knew that you were being, you know, devastating to their military exploits, and they sent their whole army to get you. And that's what happens. Verse 13, he says, go get him. And they said, he's in Dothan. So he sent horses and chariots and a great army. I mean, they didn't come quietly. If you know anything about the Middle East, dust, and you can hear them coming, clattering on the rock roads, and they're all coming along. And here is um, Elisha, and he's in Dothan, having his breakfast, probably reading his Bible, had his quiet time. He's sitting out on the deck, and he has his feet up, and he's drinking his coffee. And the servant of the man of God arose early and went out. He didn't have his devotions. He was, you know, out doing something else. And he looked outside the wall. He, he was probably walking somewhere and he looked over the wall and he went, <gasps> and he looked and all you could see is Syrians. You know, they normally, when they conquered, they found all the expectant women and they got them together and they cut them open and pulled them and pulled the babies out. And then they killed the mother and the baby. That was their method of terrorizing people. It's calling ripping open women. And here are these Syrians, the women ripper openers, all the way around. And he walked all the way around the wall, and they were all the way around the city. And he got scared to death. And he ran back, and he says, oh, no, verse 15 at the end, what are we going to do? And he answered, this is calm, cool Elisha. Don't fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then this is great. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, it doesn't say exactly whether the Syrians were out there and this ring of fire was around Dothan or whether there was a wider ring of fiery horses and chariots circling the whole area. It really doesn't matter. But what communicated was that God was in charge. And I mean, it, it's kind of like if you've got the entire army of God where one angel killed 185,000 uh, Assyrians a little later in the book, I mean, what would a whole army do, right? And so what he saw was that he could trust God completely and he lived that way. And we're going to mention this again later. Number six, he learned about human nature. Verse 11, he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed and the man of God wept. And this is uh, the ripping open stuff. Look at verse 12. He said, why are you weeping? He says, because I know the evil you're going to do the children of Israel. Their strongholds you'll set on fire. Their young men you'll kill with swords and you will dash their children and rip open their women with child. Isn't that amazing? That's actually the, the next point that he had compassion for God's people. A servant of God will understand human nature. He was looking at Hazel, and he knew that guy. And he knew that the information he gave him he was going to use to kill his master, and that he was going to become the next king. And he went back home and killed his master. And the devastation he was going to bring on the nation of Israel caused Elisha to weep. He had compassion. Now they deserved it. They were worshiping all the false gods. They'd hauled in all their idols. They'd built the high places. They'd done all this awful stuff. They deserved destruction. But he still had a heart of compassion. And a servant of God will be a follower. They'll be humble. They'll be impartial. They'll do things God's way. They'll trust him and not be afraid. They'll understand human nature. They'll have compassion for God's people. And look at chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. They'll even learn to delegate. And this is the old thing about don't do anything alone. Do it with someone else. And then they can do it better than you and let them do it. And that's what he did. And Elisha, verse 1, uh, the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets. He says, go get your oil ready and go anoint the next king. Now, it's a big deal to anoint the king. I don't know if you realize that. The Roman Catholic Church always anointed the kings in Europe during the Middle Ages. Do you know why? Because what's higher, the crown or the one that puts it on your head? And the one that has the authority to put it on your head, the one that puts it on your head. And so they made all the kings of Europe. Remember Charlemagne, Charles the Great, he came and at Canossa, bowed on his knee. Uh, in fact, um, Henry 
was it Henry the Seventh? I don't know my history that well, but one of them was a bad guy, and he didn't pay his stuff to the church, and so the Pope Boniface VIII made him get on his knees outside of his cathedral in the snow and spend a long time out there before he crowned him. Who was in charge? The person crowning. Well, it's a big deal to crown people. And look at Elisha set that aside and delegated someone. He says, I don't need to do all the big stuff. You do it. You go crown Jehu and anoint him as the next king. He learned to delegate. B, there must be a faith that won't be dissuaded. Now, we started covering that, but look at chapter 2 again, real quickly. Chapter 2 of 2 Kings. He couldn't be turned back. You couldn't stop him. If you look at verse 3, the sons of the prophets came, and he says, hey, Elisha's going to go away. And he says, I know, be quiet. Verse 4, Elijah says to him, or Elijah, he says, stay uh, here. And he says, no, I won't. Verse 5, the sons of the prophets, they tried to get him. Do you notice that no matter what, he wouldn't turn back? And that's, that's faith. He could not be dissuaded. He couldn't be turned back. Now, he wouldn't let other servants of the Lord discourage him. Did you know some people get turned back from serving the Lord by other servants of the Lord? Someone comes up and says, I don't think you did very well teaching your Sunday school lesson. And they'll go, okay, I'm not going to teach Sunday school anymore. They let other servants of the Lord dissuade them and turn them back from serving the Lord. Did you know that unless the Lord tells me not to do something, that I really, if he told me to do it, then he's the only one that can we not to do it? And other servants of the Lord shouldn't dissuade us and discourage us. Secondly, and this is where it gets very devotional, Elisha had to cross, look at verse 8, the Jordan. And it says, Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Now listen. Elisha had to cross the Jordan. Now, historically, this has always been a picture. What's it in all the spirituals? Deep river. You know, I'm going over Jordan. It's, it's a, talking about death. And spiritually, death to self-life. See, when he crossed the Jordan, what he was doing was, he was following Elijah at all costs, and he was dying to all of his selfish desires that were on the other side of the river. It's, it's a real picture of dying to self-life before fullness of the Spirit comes. Now, the Scriptures always say this, before we can have the fullness of God's Spirit in our life, we have to be emptied of self. You understand that? God's spirit cannot coexist with fullness of self. If we are full of selfishness, it grieves and quenches God's spirit. So the the next thing that this faith in Elisha's life was, he wouldn't let anybody discourage him, but he also had to cross the Jordan picturing the death to his old self-life before he would have the fullness of the spirit. Thirdly, Elisha always looked. Look in verse 10. He always looked at his master. He said, you have asked a hard thing. Because what he asked for in verse 9 was a double portion. Nevertheless, Elijah said, if you see me when I'm taken away from you, it will be for you. But if not, it won't be so. You know what he said? Turn your eyes upon Elijah. Isn't this an interesting? You wonder, which are we in the New Testament? We have an ascending master. We have waiting disciple. And he's going to be clothed with power. What does that sound like? What? Pentecost, right? Ascending master, waiting disciples to be clothed with power. He says, tarry in Jerusalem for ten more days, and you're going to be clothed with power, and Pentecost comes. Kind of sounds similar, doesn't it? It's the same idea. That's why God put these pictures in. He put them in because God always works the same way. He always works the same way. Now, before the cross, he had a plan, and it was always looking forward to the cross. After the cross, we look back at the cross, but he's always done the same thing. It's always been his Holy Spirit working. It's always been whether or not you will be his servant, whether you obey him. And what we see here is that Elisha always looked at his master just as we must. Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus. Do you see? Our master isn't Elijah. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And a true servant of God, number one, won't let other servants discourage him. Number two, is going to cross the Jordan regularly, dying to our old self-life. Number three, always looking unto Jesus, our master, just like he looked unto his master Elijah. And four, look what happens in verse 12. Elisha tore his clothes in half, showing that, that all of his own self-sufficiency was gone. He just tore his garments. And what he said is, this is what this used to be good enough for me, but I don't want this anymore. I want the mantle that came down to me out of heaven from my master. And verse 12, it says, And Elisha saw it as his master went up by a whirlwind into heaven. 
in this, the horses and chariots of fire of God. And Elisha saw that, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. Just a sidelight. Did you know that's what Dwight L. Moody said when he died? He sat up in bed and he said, The horsemen of God. And boom, he died. He thought about that so much. He, would, he just thought of that. Going to heaven was just going up like Elisha or Elijah into the presence of God. And he took hold of his own clothes, tore them in two, verse 13, and he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Now look at verse 13 and 14. I mean the next one, verse 14. He took the mantle and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when also he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. You know what this is a picture of? There's so many things. I mean, I could just go the whole time on this. This is a neat part of Scripture. But what do you mean in verse 9 about a double portion? Does that mean he was a piggy? You know, sometimes my children say, I want the big piece. He wasn't saying, I want the big piece. He said, I want the firstborn's inheritance. The firstborn got the double inheritance, and everybody else got to divide the rest. What he's saying is, I followed you the whole time. I want to be your, you know, your successor. Give me all I can have. You know, give me the, the biggest portion I can have to serve the Lord. And so he did. He let his mantle fall on him, and he was clothed with power. And he went out and just perform marvelous, marvelous miracles, just like we can be clothed with power. And I don't mean to hurry over, but I hope you'll munch through that a lot, because especially the picture of the ascending master and the waiting disciples and being clothed with power is such a powerful thing, and it's something we need to meditate on. Secondly, you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll talk to people, pray with people, and all we're doing is treating the symptoms, not the heart of the matter. And, and that's what is portrayed in this little... Uh, Miracle that Elisha performs. Let's read it in verse 19. And it's kind of neat. There it says, uh, The men of the city, and that's Jericho, said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of this city. It's pleasant. I mean, it's beautiful. It's like Palm Springs. Only only they grow the largest citrus in the world there. I mean, you can, and, and there's a stop there, a caravan stop with camels and everything. You can buy these great big citrus fruits and big dates and all kinds of stuff. It's still a beautiful city. But, verse 19, the situation is pleasant, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. Nothing grows here because there's poisonous water. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And he went out to the source of the water. Why did he do that? I mean, if God wanted to fix the thing, he could just throw it in the stream back there. Why? Go through the bushes to the source. Because there's a spiritual lesson here in a picture. He says, go to the source of the water and cast the salt there. And he said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water from it. There shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remained healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. And it's still healed to this day. Did you know that it's teeming, that, that spring gurgles out of the ground still right there by Jericho? It's, there are fish, I mean freshwater fish living there, and the whole place looks just like Palm Springs. It's surrounded by all kinds of lush and verdant tropical plants. And it's all because he attacked the source of the problem. Now here are some points. A, the poison spring caused a lack of fruit. B, Elisha put a salt in a new bowl and poured it in the source of the spring. God took away the barrenness and death just as the gospel changes lives from the heart. The source of the problem. What do the scriptures say? We as Christians are to be the salt of the earth. Did you know that we are supposed to go out with a message not trying to refine people's externals? I mean, it's nice. I, I'm all for habitat for humanity, building houses for people that don't have houses. But you can put a bad person in a new house, and they will not get better. But you can take a bad person in a bad house and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ, or a bad person in a good house, or a big house, or a fancy house, and give them the gospel, and they'll change at the source. Make sure that when you read this book, and when you study the Bible, that you equip yourselves to deal with change from the heart. Because we look at the Bible not to get platitudes or to get comfort, but to change our hearts. Because if we get changed at the source, then we're transformed.
Now, a real servant of the Lord focuses on the source of problems. When someone comes to you and they say, oh, you know, my family's falling apart and I don't like my job and I'm depressed and I'm all this, we don't go, well, you need to get more exercise and you need to change your diet and you need to, you know, get out and, you know, open your windows and your... No, we say, you know what, that's a heart problem. And the Bible says that you are going to be restless until you learn to rest in Christ. That you are desperately wicked and you're like the waves of the sea foaming up filth, as, as Isaiah says, until God gives you a new heart, a new spirit. A servant of God, secondly, focuses on the source of the problem. Let's go to the third one. A servant of God knows the secret of humility. Look at chapter 3, verse 15, and follow along. This is beautiful. And I read this story over and over, and I couldn't figure out why it was even in there. I mean, it's cute, but what is going on? But then you kind of see it after a while. And this is what? You learn the secret of humility because the way God sent water to aid Israel in the battle against Moab has a lesson on the way the Spirit of God works. And I started seeing that, and, and there's some great sermons I read on this. A, God knows the way. He had a specific way he wanted them to deal with the problem, 315. Now bring me a musician. And so, and this is common back then, they would play, like remember David played, and it calmed Saul. Well, Elisha had this guy play, and it happened when the musician played, and let me put a caveat, uh, caveat here, music is very important. Be careful what kind of music you listen to. Did you know music can rile you up? Or can calm you down? Did you know music can, can bring out the, the beast or the beauty in us? And be very careful. Music is not amoral. It's very moral. And it can be very immoral. You know, I've heard people say, oh, you know, as long as the words are okay, music doesn't matter. Oh, really? I was just in a room today visiting someone. And all of a sudden, they turned on very loud, very loud pulsating rock music. And you know what I noticed? 26 people in the room. There were 27 of us. Their whole bodies just start going. And I was standing still. I thought, what's wrong with me? Why am I not moving? And, you know, and just all different parts of them started moving like this. And I don't think that they really even realized they were doing that. That music triggered a response in them. And probably they dance all the time. I don't know why they get all this stuff going, but watch out. Music, though, brought out this prophecy in him. And look at verse 16. Thus says the Lord, make a valley full of ditches. See, God has a specific way he does things. I mean, I wouldn't have done that. I would have brought it over the mountain like a waterfall. It would have been much more grand. You know, as long as, you know, if I was God, I would do a spectacular, you know, a water dump. He said, no, no, make ditches in the valley, low ditches. And then what happens here? And thus says the Lord, verse 17, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that valley will be filled with water so that your cattle and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. Besides that, he's also going to kill all the Moabites. He said, it's nothing for me. Okay, A, God knows the way. He has a specific way. B, God loves the humble way. Did you know God usually uses the, if he has a choice between a spectacular and a simple, guess which one he uses? The simple. Who did he announce the birth of Christ to? The shepherds. The lowest people on the socioeconomic ladder. Who did he pick to be the apostles? Fishermen. I mean, the guys with the, the fat fingers from tying the ropes, you know, and they were real klutzy and they had funny uh, accents, you know, and everybody in Jerusalem went, oh, they are Galileans. God loves the humble. He uses the lowly and the humble means to accomplish his purposes. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27. Here we go. Uh, For God hath not chosen the wise of this world or the rich, but God hath chosen the base and the things that are despised to bring to naught the things that are. God chooses the simple things in life to use, the humble, to accomplish his purposes. Thirdly, God works in mysterious ways. The waters came without sound or sight, just like the working of the Spirit is usually done. Do you know what it says in the Scripture about the Holy Spirit? It says that the Holy Spirit... It's like a wind that blows where it listeth, and you can hear the sound. You don't know where it's come from. You don't know where it's going. God works in mysterious ways, and he's trying to show that to Elisha. And finally, God speaks through Christ. I love this. Look at verse 20. Now, it happened in the morning when the grain offering was offered. Do you remember way back we talked about the grain offering? And that that pictured the sinless body of Christ, his perfect humanity. Isn't it interesting in verse 20 that when they offered the grain offering, that suddenly the water came after the grain offering? Now you say, so what? Wait a minute. 
all of the offerings in the feast pointed to Christ. The grain offering specifically spoke of his body crucified on the tree as it was totally given. What happened after the cross? What was poured out onto the earth, specifically onto the church? The Holy Spirit. After the cross. And so that's why I wrote down here, the grain offering portrayed the offering of the perfect body of Christ as a sacrifice. So the blessing of Pentecost followed the sacrifice of Calvary. God didn't pour out his spirit until Christ was offered. God didn't pour the water into the valley, into the ditches, until after they offered the grain offering. They could have, they could have done a lot. They could have put five olives out. You know what I mean? But God says, no, I, I have a reason for all this. I want to portray something, and it's beautiful. A servant of God finds the sufficiency of the Spirit in uh, 1 through 7 of 2 Kings. It's, it's portrayed in the widow's oil miracle. A, she had an impossible debt. So do we. It says in Romans 1, 14 and 15, that all of us have a debt to the people around us. Did you know you're in debt? I don't mean to Bank 4 or Bank of Oklahoma or State Bank. Did you know that we all have a debt to other people around us? That's how Paul said a Christian is related to unbelievers. We have a debt to give them the gospel. This week, there are a couple of fellows that came to visit my house, and we were talking about a lot of stuff, and just as I was getting ready to share the gospel with them, they said, I've got to go, and they ran out the door, and I thought, why didn't I start that sooner? I didn't get to tell them the good news. And you know, that night, our whole family prayed for those two men that somebody else would get them because we didn't. We missed the chance. God gave us a chance. They were inside of our house. I mean, I could have stood in front of the door and said, hey, wait a minute. I want to tell you about the best thing I've ever heard. I want to tell you the best news in the world. I want to give you the best deal you've ever had. You sure don't know this. I could tell they didn't know the Lord, but I didn't get to. But we have a debt to the, the Greeks and the barbarians, the bond, the free, we have the gospel. We should tell them. We have inexhaustible resources. Oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And as, he is, as she poured her oil into empty vessels, the oil never ran out. So the Holy Spirit will flow out of us like rivers of water into the dry, empty, thirsting lives around us. Did you know this is all a picture about someone in service? This widow was a woman who was a widow of a prophet and he was one who had been ministering for the Lord and now he died and she owed all these people money and so it's a picture of someone in the ministry that doesn't have resources and it's kind of a picture like us when we face the world around us and she says I don't know what to do and he was trying to show her that she had inexhaustible resources and I want to tell you something the Lord said we have inexhaustible resources see we have an incredible supply the provision was far more than she just needed for her debts it covered all of her daily needs too you see God's great he doesn't just give us enough strength to witness to people he gives us enough strength to have the best life you can have on earth did you know that you have the best life if you're in Christ you have the best life don't ever watch the rich and the famous on TV and salivate over it because you have something better than they could ever dream of those people live in so much fear they're, they're so empty they're afraid someone's going to take their money. They're afraid someone's going to get their place and, and they won't be popular and they're afraid they won't be beautiful anymore. And that's why some of the most famous have had so many makeovers that there's nothing left to make over. You know, they're just, it's amazing. Number five, a servant of God has genuine power. This is demonstrated in the inability of Gehazi. Gehazi, letter A, had position and uh, no power. The Lord could not use him because he had a deceitful and greedy heart, which doesn't show up till the next chapter. Remember, Elisha sent him with a staff, and the little boy had died, and he says, run and put that staff on him. And you know what? It should have brought him back to life. They threw a dead body on top of Elisha's bones later in the book, and the dead body came back to life. Elisha was so powerful, even his bones God used. But his staff, in the hands of an unclean servant, didn't count at all because he had a greedy heart. Letter B, Elisha demonstrates true reliance on God. He was clothed with power. He raised the child from the dead. He went in with prayer. He gave himself, remember, eye to eye, cheek to cheek, the whole deal. Number six, a servant of God declares the gospel of a humble and contrite approach to God. Look at the nine humiliating steps God took Na uh, Naaman through. Because the gospel is a very humbling and is for contrition. When you come to God, you should come humbly and contritely. Uh, that's what always bothers me about people they come up and you say you want to get saved they go oh yeah man, I want to get saved it sounds great to me I don't know if they understood it that they have offended a holy God that they have 
brought despot and on the name of Christ, and he had to die in their place. And they just come up, you know, just jiving. And I mean, maybe they can do that for a while, but if you really get an idea of the gospel, it really crushes you, and it it humbles, and, and it makes you contrite. And that's what God does with uh, this guy. Look at this. Number one, in verse 3 of chapter 5, he heard from a captive slave. Isn't that interesting? This great, great Naaman heard the first time about this healer from a slave girl. Number two, look in verse 7. He thought it was going to be a king that would save him. He writes to the king, and it wasn't a great king. God humbled him a little more. The king of Israel couldn't help him. Number three, he sent, in verse 5, all this gold and silver. He thought you could buy it, and he found out it wasn't for sale, even for a lot of money. Uh, Look at verse 9. Naaman went with his horses and went before Elisha's house. He had to go to a poor prophet's house. I mean, he thought he was going to go to some resort and get healed. And he went outside this little tiny house. On top of that, Elisha sent a messenger, verse 10. He didn't even come out. Did you know Elisha didn't even bother to look at Naaman? God said, this guy's too proud. Don't even go out there. Send out your servant. And he did, the messenger. And the messenger told him, go wash in the Jordan. And Naaman, verse 11, became furious. Do you see what his real problem was? Pride. He wanted a big shebang. God wouldn't give it to him. Verse 12, are not the, are the Abana and the Parfar rivers in Damascus better? He said, I'm not going to wash in some insignificant muddy river. Verse 13, his servants came near and spoke to him. They said, you've come this far. Come on. He had to get taught by his servants. That's the seventh humbling step. Verse 14, he went down and dipped. Did you know that he couldn't be cured unless he obeyed? God says, go down and dip in the river. What if he'd have had his servants come and pour it on his head? It wouldn't have worked. Because God says, you've got to do it my way. And then look at this. Verse 14, the end. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. He had to become like a little child. You know, I think this guy really got saved in our terms. Because he came to God, God's way. Uh, letter 8, Naaman was great and loyal and brave. But he was a leper, just like all of us, sons and daughters of Adam. We're in the image of God, but we're lost. B, a tiny spot of leprosy was enough to have absolute expulsion from God's people. Do you know what the Bible says? Whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends one point is guilty of all. If you have sinned even once, then you're guilty of everything in God's sight. Because it's written, there's no one righteous, no, not one. Letter C, God made Naaman go through the most humbling nine-step path to receive his healing. I just showed that to you. Salvation often comes by similar means. An insignificant messenger, think about who told you about Christ. Probably was some... Sunday school teacher somewhere, or somebody you don't even hardly remember, you heard and didn't mean much to you right then. Sometimes it's an insignificant messenger, and you learn that no good works or upright living can earn it. You find out that you can't wash yourself in your own rivers of personal reform. Nothing can take away the guilt of sin, only 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us. Well, beware. Christians can lose their cutting edge by quenching the Spirit. Letter B is stop. Whenever you find out God's power has left you, stop right there. No work can proceed without the axe head. The self-generated service does nothing more than chopping with an axe handle would accomplish felling of trees. In other words, if you don't have the Holy Spirit just uh, pulsating through your life, stop. Because he's grieved, he's quenched, and you just have to stop. And don't try and do anything else. It says in John 15, 15, apart from me you can do nothing. And let her see, go back. And the prophets went back where they lost the axe head. And you know what? We have to go back where we lost the blessing. And it says in Revelation 2, 5, remember the height from which you've fallen, repent, and do the things you did at first. Go back. And then finally, a servant of God sees God in all of their life. Serve him and trust him. And can you tell this is one of my favorite books yet? They're getting better and better. I want to close with this exhortation to you. This is probably the most devotional of all the books we've covered. There's an awful lot about the Christian life here. This is a book that's entirely about serving God. And if you want to serve God, you've got to be a follower, humble, doing things God's way, have compassion, absolutely surrender, have faith, focus on the internal needs, Know the secret of humility. Find the sufficiency of the Spirit. Really be empowered and and tell people the gospel of contrition and humility. Uh, Really stress to them. Make sure you get them lost before you try and get them saved. Or else they won't really get saved. Because God is a God that came to seek and to save the lost.
No good people go to heaven. Only us bad people that know we're bad and know that only Christ can save us. Let's bow. Father, I, I know that you laid so much in my heart for someone, and I pray that whoever it is, that your spirit would just wing home the message you wanted them to hear, whether it be about going back to the place where they lost their power, or whether it's just coming to the foot of the cross in humble contrition and finding you, O Christ, or whether it's just learning the secret of humility and all the steps that Elisha followed. We pray that we would all be better servants because we were challenged